Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on discrimination and tenant screening. My name is Michelle Uzetta. I'm the Deputy Legal Director at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, um, or DREDF. DREDF is a national nonprofit law and policy center focused primarily on the rights of people with disabilities and disability rights as they intersect with other types of marginalized communities. Um, I'm really happy to have Chancellor Almansor, who is the executive director of the Southern California Housing Rights Center, as a co-presenter today, um, and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Um, I know that some people joined after the housekeeping announcements were made. Um, both the chat and the Q&A are open. Um, please use the Q&A to post questions. If there is time at the end of the webinar, and we hope there will be, we can answer some questions live. Um, if you just have information you want to share with people who are in attendance, go ahead and use the chat for those purposes. Next slide. So the agenda today is quite simple, but there is a lot of information we've packed in. Um, we are going to talk about Section 8 discrimination. Um, we're also going to talk about other screening protections for tenants, including the use of income and financial requirements, um, the use of credit history, the use of criminal history, and also we have a slide on AI and tenant screening. And then we'll talk a little bit about strategy, strategies and enforcement. Next slide, please. So first we're gonna start with source of income discrimination and specifically section eight discrimination. Next slide, please. So from the outset, it's important to understand why section eight is so important to people. Uh, and there are a few reasons why, and I'll just pause for a second so folks can look at the slide and then we'll go over the information in the slide. Okay, so Section 8 is a main source of affordable housing for low-income people. It bridges the gap between low wages and high housing costs. It's estimated that 2.1 million households nation not, nationwide uh, are eligible and utilize Section 8 assistance, and that 35% of those households include a person with a disability. There are over 300,000 households utilizing Section 8 assistance in California. The Section 8 program increases housing opportunities for low-income people who are disproportionately Black, Brown, and or disabled. It also makes safe, decent, safe, safe twice, safe, decent, and sanitary housing available to people who are low-income. It promotes fair housing choice, meaning you get to live where you want, mobility. And it also increases access to housing that's near transportation, schools, and employment opportunities. The Section 8 program also reduces segregation and con concentration of poverty, because again, it allows people to live in neighborhoods they might not otherwise be able to afford. And it also prevents homelessness. Next slide, please. So what is the problem? Well, we find that discrimination against Section 8 recipients is widespread. There are unfounded stereotypes and misconceptions about voucher users and the Section 8 program. For example, people have uh, ideas that folks who are on Section 8 don't want to work or are drug users criminals, et cetera. We've also found that Section 8 is used as, or Section 8 discrimination has been used as a pretext for other types of discrimination. Because Section 8 is disproportionately used by people who are Black, Brown, and or disabled, discrimination against Section 8 disproportionately impacts those communities. On this slide, I also provide a link to a blog post that DREDF has on its website 
called Speaking the Truth About Section 8 that kind of pushes back against some of these narratives and stereotypes about the program. Another problem with Section 8 is that it's a use it or lose it type of program. The wait lists to get a voucher are very long. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, there's been periods of over 10 years when the wait list has been closed, and then it'll be open for just a, a couple of weeks for people to try to get a voucher. And then also, if you are one of the lucky ones to get a voucher, they are time limited. Generally, people are given about 60 days to find a unit. You can sometimes get an extension from your housing authority, but that's not always going to be available. So if discrimination is widespread and persistent, and you only have two months to find a unit, that creates a very critical situation for a lot of people. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk about the law and how it applies to Section 8 discrimination. And again, I'll pause so you can take a look at this slide before we go over it. So under federal law, the Federal Fair Housing Act does not contain an express prohibition on Section 8 discrimination. Uh, there are some exceptions for other types of federal programs. For example, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is a program that provides a tax incentive to construct or rehabilitate affordable rental housing for low-income households. In that program, properties are expressly prohibited from discriminating against voucher holders. Owners of housing are required to certify their compliance with that requirement, uh, as well as other types of things, annually. And state housing agencies are responsible for monitoring owner compliance with this requirement. Some other exceptions include the Home Investment Partnership Program or the HOME Program. And that's a program that provides federal block grants to state and local governments to create affordable housing for low-income households. Also, the Mark to Market program, which is a program that preserves affordability and availability of low-income rental multifamily properties with federally insured mortgages. Also, multiple family units purchased from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as a few others. And also on this slide, I provide a resource, a, a publication from the Department of Housing and Urban Development entitled Source of Income Protections for Housing Choice Vouchers. Next slide, please. On a state level, um, and again, I'll just pause for a moment for accessibility purposes to allow people to look at the slide before I move on. Okay, in terms of state law protections, 16 states, in addition to uh, the District of Columbia and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, prohibit, they have laws prohibiting discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders. They include California, Connecticut, Colorado, Hawaii, Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington. In addition, there are five states with limited source of income laws. For example, Delaware, Delaware provides some limited protection for voucher holders. Maine and Minnesota have laws in place, but they've been weakened by court interpretation. In Texas, voucher discrimination is only prohibited by homeowners associations. And Wisconsin has a source of income um, law, but it does not 
include housing vouchers. And that data was obtained from the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. Um, their website is linked on this slide. They update their information about source of income laws every couple of months. It's a pretty good resource. Next slide. Many local municipalities also have source of income protections, approximately well, over 120 counties or cities nationwide prohibit source of income discrimination, including Section 8 discrimination. And this includes cities and counties in states that have state law protections. For example, Denver has a source of income local law, and Buffalo in New York has a local law, even though both of those states also have a local uh, have a state law. It also includes cities and counties in states that do not have state protections. For example, the state of Arizona does not have a state protection, but Tucson does have its own local protection. The same for St. Louis and Albuquerque. And the resource for the information on state protections is also where you can obtain information about local protections. Next slide. This slide, I'll give people a couple of seconds to look at it. This slide contains a list of the 19 municipalities in California, both cities and counties, that have local ordinances prohibiting Section 8 discrimination. And I will just read off the list for accessibility purposes. It includes Alameda, Berkeley, Court Madera, East Palo Alto, Fairfax, both the city and the county of Los Angeles, Marin County, Mill Valley, Milpitas, Novato, San, I don't even know how to pronounce this city. I'm sorry, San Anselmo, San Diego. Anselmo. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. Yeah. Only because I live, I'm lived up there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank know. you. San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, San Rafael, Santa Clara County, the unincorporated parts only, Santa Monica, and Woodland. Next slide. So let's look a little deeper at California law. Uh, California's Fair Employment and Housing Law was uh, amended fairly recently by Senate Bill 329, 329, and that was effective January 1st of 2020. Now, that bill amended the Fair Employment and Housing Act, or FEHA, to make it clear that landlords with rental properties in California cannot discriminate based on a person's source of income, and they redefined what source of income means. Next slide, please. Like other prohibitions in FIHA, the source of income uh, discrimination prohibition applies to a broad range of housing providers, all housing providers who rent residential properties in California. Now, this would include rental and leasing agents, management companies, landlords, as well as homeowners associations, condo associations, corporations, and housing authorities. And someone just posted in the Q&A, is Section 8 considered a source of income? Yes, it is. Uh, next slide, please. That was exactly what the bill that I just mentioned two slides ago did. It redefined source of income to include specific things. And I'll pause for a moment so people can read the new definition on this slide. So 
So source of income is now defined under FIHA as the following. Lawful verifiable income paid directly to a tenant, a tenant's representative, or housing owner on behalf of a tenant, including federal, state, or local public assistance and federal, state, or local housing subsidies. And it specifically includes Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher rest, Rental Assistance, Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Vouchers, Financial Aid from any program that provides rental assistance, homeless assistance, security deposit assistance, or rapid rehousing. So it's pretty broad definition. And folks who've been doing um, fair housing work for some time will remember you know, before 2020, uh, the courts defined source of income discrimination as excluding Section 8 vouchers and other types of rental assistance. So this change was really important. And a lot of folks, um, in particular at, at the legal aid organizations, really pushed for this change to happen. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide contains some of the prohibited activities, things that landlords and housing providers can no longer do uh, based on source of income. So I'll pause so people can look at the list and then we'll go over it. So the prohibited activities include the refusal to rent or renew an agreement for tenancy. So if somebody's applying for housing and using a voucher, you cannot discriminate against them. If someone's an in-place tenant and starts to use a voucher, you cannot terminate their tenancy or tell them they can no longer live in the apartment uh, because their income source has changed. It also prohibits interruption or, again, termination of tenancy, includes falsely representing that a rental unit is not available, prohibits uh, different terms or conditions, like I'll, I'll accept your Section 8 voucher, but in exchange you have to pay this or do this or you are limited in the benefits of your housing. It also includes refusing to complete forms, sign documents, or make repairs. Um, and this is a way that uh, landlords and housing providers often discriminate without expressly saying they're discriminating. Um, they may refuse to complete the forms required by a public housing authority to um, complete approval of a unit for, for use by a, someone who's using a voucher. They may refuse to execute documents. They may refuse to make uh, simple repairs that are necessary for the unit to qualify and pass inspection. And those can also be um, uh, types of discrimination prohibited under FIHA now. Uh, it also it includes harassment based on source of income or any otherwise, any other way of making housing unavailable. There's kind of this catch-all safety net provision in FIHA um, that captures other types of discrimination that may not be enumerated. Next slide, please. Advertising is something I, I pulled out for a, se a separate slide, and I'll give folks a second to look at the definition of what's prohibited in terms of advertising. The advertising uh, prohibition is kind of a mouthful. Um, it's unlawful to make, print, or publish, or cause to be made, printed, or published, any kind of notice, statement, or advertising, advertising with respect to the sale or rental of housing that indicates a preference, limitation, or discrimination based on source of income, or an intention to make that kind of a preference, limitation, or discrimination. Next slide. 
Here are some examples of discriminatory advertisements. I'm sorry if the print is not terribly big. These are all from um, real life cases that I've handled or are in the process of handling over just the last year. Um, in the top left corner, um, you'll see that the fourth bullet under minimum rental requirements says no Section 8, um, as well as other things. That is discriminatory. That's a clear express ban on Section 8 tenants. Any ordinary person reading that ad will think, who uses a voucher will think, I don't qualify, I cannot apply for that unit. That's a discriminatory advertisement. Um, right below there, um, this was from an email exchange between a potential tenant and a landlord. And he said to her, frankly, you are better off going, on, going after properties that are already registered for Section 8. As I mentioned earlier, completing a Section 8 application is not going to be our top priority. So it will take some time on our end. That type of response may not be explicit, um, but that is a deterrent um, and it indicates an intent to discriminate by not completing paperwork in a timely way. And this particular housing provider also told the prospective tenant, we can only hold a unit for a week and it will take multiple months to get approved for section eight. So you're better off going somewhere else. That's discriminatory. In the upper right corner, um, this is from a text exchange between a prospective tenant and a landlord. He asks, hi, is this one bedroom still available? And they respond, yes. And he says, okay, great. Is Section 8 accepted? No, sorry. That's discrimination. And then below that, no Section 8 accepted. Don't even ask. That's clear discrimination. And these, again, are things that happened recently within the last year or so in California, in a municipality with a local ordinance, um, both of which have been in effect since 2020. Um, so you'll see these types of discrimination um, continue to happen and on a pretty um, wide basis. Um, next slide. Okay, I'm going to pass it to Chancellor now to talk about other screening protections. Hello, everybody. I'm Chancellor Mansour, the Executive Director of the Housing Rights Center. We're located in Los Angeles, California. We're the nation's largest and oldest, oldest fair housing council, and we also provide eviction defense and homeless prevention legal services. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to get into a little into a little bit more detail in terms of some of the uh, ways in which housing providers uh, use methods to discriminate against uh, tenants, against prospective uh, applicants for their um, housing. So um, I'm going to give a second for people to read th and uh, this slide. So um, what um, this slide represents is the California government code. Um, it was, it's the, um, and, and it, so there's always been a California government code that uh, um, that prohibits discrimination in housing. Um, it's part of the FIHA, the Fair Employment and Housing Act, or it, it, it is, it's, it's what, um, what codifies it as well. Um, but it was recently amended under SB 267, to provide even greater protection to tenants who rely on a government rental subsidy um, for their housing. And so in particular, um, what it did is it expanded it um, saying that if there is a government subsidy involved, then it is illegal to base uh, the rental amount um, uh, on anything other than the tenant's um, uh, the tenant's portion of the rent. So I'm just going to read exactly what it says because it's a little bit confusing. When dealing with a government rent subsidy, such as Section 8, financial or income standards must be based on the tenant's share of the rent, not the total rent. Next slide, please. So under SB 627, 
which as I said, would just became effective this in January of this year. It prohibits the use of Section 8 applicants' credit history as part of the application process. And I'm gonna give um, people a, a moment to read this slide. So specifically what um, the uh, amendment does is it um, says that the when a housing provider is going to use the credit history of a uh, person who wants to use a government subsidy, they have to provide them with the opportunity to um, provide a lawful, verifiable alternative evidence of uh, another way in which they can afford to pay rent. So these are some examples. Um, this is not all inclusive, um, but some examples of what a tenant can provide is that they're receiving other government benefit payments. They can provide their pay records or their bank statements um, or other piece of, pieces of evidence to show basically that they are credit worthy and able to pay, again, based on what their portion of the rent um, should be not based on what the entire rent should be and what the um, government agency would be paying. In addition, a housing provider must give the applicant additional time to provide that alternative evidence. I just want to say on a side note, that's very important. We are seeing um, a lot of housing providers that basically are telling tenants, we will take your Section 8 voucher. Um, and they will say we're beginning the paperwork and the process, but they will delay it. And they um, and then they will say, well, it was costing me too much to keep the unit available, so I had to rent it to somebody else. I'll, I'll keep your application open for another unit. Trying to avoid being, um, you know, found to be discriminatory, but clearly um, avoiding this this law. So this law is very important. It says that they have to give the tenant additional time to provide evidence. Next slide, please. So this is a, a list, a, a list that we kind of put together of some of the ways um, in which unlawful screening of tenants can take place. These are some of the ways in which it takes place. Uh, this isn't just for Section 8 or government subsidized. This is for all tenant applicants. And I'm going to pause for a moment um, so people can review the slide. So, um, and I'm gonna read the list. The first is refusing to complete paperwork or delaying paperwork. I just um, spoke of how that you know, is, is happening. Um, or, or the other thing is losing paperwork, saying that they sent it to the housing authority case manager when maybe they didn't or sending incomplete paperwork um, or that they somehow delaying that, that process. Um, saying that the building is not registered as Section 8 um, when it is, and I'm sorry, these things do obviously do pertain just to Section 8 tenants, um, but saying that the building is not registered as Section 8 um, when, Technically, unless this is project based Section 8, it doesn't have to be registered as Section 8. So that's just a pretextual um, excuse. Um, another thing uh, they may do is only consider employment income, like verifiable employment income. Um, a lot of tenants, especially low income tenants, tenants of color, rely on other forms of income, and housing providers should, per should uh, consider those other forms of income if they're legal forms of income. Uh, saying that the credit, their credit is too low, and in particular without providing um, a, an exact uh, eligibility standard about what that credit rating should be. And, and that's in general a problem overall for tenant applicants um, is that there's a, a, a lack of transparency about what the eligibility standards are for that housing. Going back to the list saying the process takes months and units can only be held for a brief time. So that's often used to discourage the applicant from even applying for the unit. Um, raising the rent after the household with the voucher applies. Um, you know, a lot of tenants with Section 8 vouchers, they are savvy and they will not disclose that they have Section 8 or try to wait until they are as, as far in the rental application process as they can. 
Unfortunately, there have been cases of landlords who've tried to sue tenants, prospective tenants for fraud in that situation, saying that they should have disclosed it. Um, I'm not aware of any law that says that they have to disclose that fact, but there are some landlords that are pushing back on that. Um, but um, the but the bottom line is, you know, that is a way in which it is it, it is used, um, in, in, in uh, where all of a sudden the landlord will then change the rules of the game in some way or another after the tenant discloses that they are going to use a Section 8 voucher. Another thing that a landlord may do is accuse the household of fraud, and, and I'm sorry, that, that uh, kind of leaped ahead for not disclosing that they had a voucher. Um, another thing that the uh, potential housing provider may do is use the criminal history and eviction records um, of that prospective tenant without mitigation. And I'm we're going to go into a little bit more detail about that um, in, in another slide. Another thing a housing provider may do is use improperly use eviction records, um, and I will go into that a little bit more so. And uh, an overall lack of transparency of the whole process and denial. And a lot of tenant applicants will say that, um, especially once they've been denied, that they um, had no idea why they were denied. They weren't told during the process what what exactly it was. Um, and clearly, there could be a discriminatory illegal reason for doing so, but oftentimes the tenants don't know and um, why. And so that can be a problem. Next slide, please. Criminal history. Next slide, please. So um, yes, housing providers, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna give a second for people to review this slide. So um, in general, yes, housing providers uh, sometimes do look at, at a person's criminal history. We, we do know that. Um, and in, in general, all housing providers screen tenants and there are legitimate interests in to screening potential tenants. Um, as, um, as, uh, as an agency that represents tenants, you know, there, there are definitely some legitimate interests in terms of screening, but the problem is that oftentimes the screening is used in a discriminatory way um, to prevent people, especially people who are Black, Latinx, um, maybe LGBTQIA, from getting that housing because of discriminatory uh, reasons, um, because it's based on their membership in one of those protected categories. Um, and, and, um, and so people, um, and so even if a person doesn't have a criminal history, oftentimes persons in those um, who are of, for those demographics and those demographic categories, only they will be asked for their criminal records or they will be screened for criminal history, which clearly um, is a violation of uh, the state and federal Fair Housing Act. Um, not so much, well, federal Fair Housing Act quite, um, not so much criminal fair housing laws and, and are protected a little bit more so under a California law. Um, not uh, unfortunately, it's not codified under the California Fair Employment and Housing Act. Um, there are, um, it, it, and we did provide here um, um, the fact that there are regulations, however, that became effective in 2020 that do clarify when and how a housing provider can consider information about a person's criminal history. But I do want to take a side note that this is um, a law that is evolving, um, and there's a lot of adv advocacy around limiting the use of criminal um, history um, when considering rental applicants. Next slide, please. And so what exactly is uh, criminal history? I'm going to give a second, uh, a moment to pause to review the slide. and I'm going to read it. It's any record that contains individually identifiable information and describes any aspect of an individual's criminal history or contacts with any law enforcement agency. And that includes information about arrests, criminal charges or indictments, having been questioned, apprehended, taken into custody or detained, or held for investigation, regardless of whether it resulted in a criminal conviction. And this includes records from any jurisdiction, records that are not prepared strictly for law 
enforcement purposes. That That's an and records that are not prepared strictly for law enforcement purposes. And again, this is in, um, uh, codified in the uh, California Code of Regulations um, at section 12264. And this, that's two um, California Code of Regulations. Next slide, please. And a little bit more detail about the prohibited uses of criminal history information. I'm going to pause for a minute to so uh, for the review of the slide. And I'm going to read it. A housing provider's policy or practice regarding criminal history will violate California law when it has an unjustified discriminatory effect on members of a protected class, even when the provider had no intent to discriminate, is used to intentionally exclude members of a protected class. In other words, or for example, only running criminal history screening on black applicants. Or it could violate California law if it constitutes a discriminatory statement. In other words, um, a, 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 an advertisement, um, a, a blanket ban on anyone with an arrest. And, and I'll, I'll just say exactly what that means is that um, one cannot post that one will not rent to people with a criminal background check and an advertisement or a sign on a front lawn or something like that, even though it may be intentional to do so. Um, uh, later, to some to some degree, they can't post it in an advertisement. They can't put it in a in a published statement. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is about um, specific prohibited uses of criminal history information. I'm going to give a moment, a pause, a moment for the review of the slide. And this slide uh, goes into further detail of this same regulation that says that a housing provider cannot seek out or consider information about arrests that did not lead to a conviction, about being questioned, apprehended, taken into custody, detained, or held for investigation by law enforcement, or for just infractions of the law. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a continuation of specific prohibited use of criminal history information. I'm going to pause for the review of the slide. So again, a continuation of what a housing provider cannot do. Um, they cannot seek out uh, or consider information about a referral to or participation in a pretrial or post-trial diversion program or a deferred entry of judgment program. They cannot seek information about criminal convictions that have been sealed, dismissed, or expunged or matters processed in the juvenile justice system unless pursuant to a court order. That specifically says that. Um, unless offered as mitigating information, information to show that the person does not pose a current risk to the health and safety of others, to the property or to other substantial, legitimate and non-discriminatory interest of the housing provider. Next slide, please. Um, so there is a permitted use of criminal history information. I will pause a moment for, to review the slide. The housing provider can otherwise check the criminal history of an applicant. They are allowed to deny housing or take adverse action based on a directly related conviction. Um, they are allowed to direct and spe uh, specific negative relevance to, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the conviction has to be about direct and specific neg negative relevance to a sp substantial and legitimate and non-discriminatory interests of the housing provider, which is generally kind of the um, requirement of the housing provider when they uh, refuse um, a number of things under the fair under the Fair Housing Act is um, uh, the landlord is allowed to provide a legitimate non-discriminatory reason in some circumstances. 
uh, for their policy. Um, and the things that they can consider or should consider, must consider, would be the nature and severity of the crime and how long ago the crime happened to when they're now applying for this rental unit. Next slide, please. So um, we're going to get into strategies and enforcement of Section 8 discrimination. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some options um, uh, in terms of enforcement. I'm going to pause for a moment for people to review this slide. So under the California Fair Employment and Housing Act, um, when one files a, a claim and if one, uh, one can seek injunctive relief to um, get the policy uh, to suspend the, or to terminate the policy altogether or some other injunctive relief, maybe um, uh, how, um, education um, or hiring uh, uh, decisions in terms of managers being retrained or something like that. So your options in terms of enforcement, Chancela just mentioned that under FIHA, you can seek injunctive relief, monetary damages, including punitive damages if the housing provider is found to have acted in a particularly egregious fashion, and also the right to attorney's fees and costs. Um, some of the local ordinances, and I highlighted uh, Los Angeles and San Diego here, um, they also provide for injunctive relief um, but as well for three times actual damages. Um, so if there was some actual out-of-pocket loss that the prospective tenant or tenant experienced, they can get up to three times that amount or damages equal to three times the monthly rent at the time of the violation. So for example, if, uh, if I applied for a unit and used Section 8 and the uh, the rent was $1,000 and I was discriminated against under the local ordinance in Los Angeles, I could claim damages in the amount of $3,000, three times uh, that rent at the time of the violation. Uh, you also would have the uh, option of an administrative complaint to the California Civil Rights Department. Um, I don't know if that would be my first option, to be honest. Um, just because they are severely underfunded um, and have not been, they don't just don't have the resources to take on the number of, of cases um, that we might want. Um, so I'll just say that. Next slide. I'm, I'm sorry. The, the one reason why it would be good is for reporting purposes. So at least we can keep the data to file. Oh, great. Great. Do you want to go back to Chancellor then? Since and, and she's sorry, frozen? I, to, I don't know. Zoom kicked me out, so I apologize for that. But I did. I, I that is one point I did want to raise before um, we change slides. Is that um, e even though um, CRD, the Civil Rights Department, is is ha does some, has some challenges um, with um, in, enforcing some of the all the complaints that are being filed, um, it, I think every we should still file complaints because if nothing else, um, the data is used. Um, and is reported to HUD and to the federal government in terms of um, the the just the sheer number and, and the prevalence of discrimination that's happening. Because we're still trying to get this um, codified on a federal level as well. Um, thank you. I think I think we, we're going moving on to you for the next slide, Michelle. I'm sorry. It, let's go to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. This last slide is mine. Um, and yes, the discrimination against Section 8 vouchers is still very widespread. Um, I just want to give an example in the, the Housing Rights Center and like a lot of agencies, we've been testing, doing tests. And, and I'm sorry, let me give a, a, a pause a second for people to read the slide. It's pretty short. So um, I'll just say that even in, in some right here, this refers to uh, a, a, a study we did in 2021 through 2022, where we found that nearly half of the properties tested showed discrimination. We've since tested three, four times as many um, properties and uh, still find about half of them show evidence of discrimination. And just, I want to say of about half of those that show evidence of discrimination, about half of those are blatant um, 
denials uh, where the housing provider says no uh, to the, the persons who receiving Section 8. So enforcement is definitely still needed. Thank you. All right, I have the next two slides. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to jump in to talk about some um, Public Record Act requests that we did. So I'll give people a second to take a look at this slide before talking about it. All right. Um, in June of 2023, I did a public record request to the Civil Rights Department of California to ask for information regarding the number of source of income complaints received uh, and their disposition, because um, we just wanted to get that data. Um, and so it took a while, to be honest, to get the information from the Civil Rights Department. But once we did, this was kind of the basic uh, breakdown. Um, they had received over 600 source of income complaints from the period of um, January 1st, 2020, which is when the state prohibition went into effect through June 26 of 2023. Um, in that in that time, so 635 complaints. There, over half of them were no cause determinations. Um, 25 were closed due to agency discretion. Uh, 82 of them were conciliated, which is uh, you know resolved without the need for any kind of litigation. Uh, 73 were recorded as withdrawn, which I think includes ones that they closed because people didn't. Uh, respond to follow-up kind of communications, because sometimes your investigator through CRD will ask you for additional information, uh, medical records and things like that, um, some some that they don't need, some that they do. But if people don't respond, they, I think, record those as withdrawn. Um, 13 were settled by enforcement. And I understand uh, from people at CRD that to mean that they sent out letters advising landlords, what you're doing is discriminatory, please agree to change this. Um, and then in terms of lawsuits, there's believed to only have been one filed and that was in January of 2023. I provide a link to the press release there. I, I believe also that one was settled. Um, in recent, you know, advocates, and many of you on this webinar, have um, engaged in quarterly meetings with CRD to talk about um, fair housing enforcement. And um, I know that they would like to prioritize more pieces of litigation. Again, it's a it's a resource issue, um, but you know it's one of those things that we can all press for the state to fund the department more. Um, and Chancellor had mentioned the importance of filing complaints, even if they aren't investigated or accepted for investigation. There's really no harm in filing a complaint with CRD, uh, even if they decide to no cause it. Um, it doesn't have any kind of effect on your ability to file a lawsuit. It doesn't, you know, ban you or bar you from filing a lawsuit um, based on the same facts and law later on. Um, I guess that's all I'll say uh, about that, except to say, um, if you do file a complaint with the Civil Rights Department and they come back and, and no cause it, you do have the right to appeal. If you disagree and you have information or even new information that you wanna present, you can follow their appeal process. Um, and that is documented on their, their website. So don't, don't feel like you have no other option at that point. Um, because you can appeal and they do frequently uh, decide to open things after you appeal. Um, and you can also still file a lawsuit. Um, again, it has no, no value. It uh, doesn't ban you from a lawsuit later on. Next slide, please. Um, we also did public record requests to all the, the 19 California municipalities that have um, source of income ordinances not included on this slide is East Palo Alto, which I 
you know, recently adopted an ordinance and I sent a public record act request to them. They haven't responded yet, um, but I assume their response will probably be similar to the rest of the municipalities here. Um, only one of the cities or counties that have source of income prohibitions via ordinance or, or local law um, has done affirmative enforcement. Um, and that is the city of Santa Monica. And that is largely due to the personnel that were there who had um, who have good relationships with the legal aid organization. Um, and they teamed to do some enforcement activity. Um, some of these cities do contract with fair housing providers and rely on the fair housing providers to um, participate in enforcement. But um, in general, I think advocates would like cities to get more involved in enforcing the law, or at least helping get the word out that in, you know, in our city, in our county, source of income discrimination is illegal, and we, uh, we would like for landlords to comply. Um, not many of these cities provide information on their websites, on their housing websites, not many of these cities uh, conduct training or highlight the fact that source of income is prohibited. Um, and again, uh, with the exception of Santa Monica, none of them are doing affirmative enforcement work. So as an advocate out there, um, engage with your cities about doing more um, in terms of helping uh, fight the widespread Section 8 discrimination that's still occurring. Um, I think the next slide is Chancellors, thank you. So um, some strategies for addressing voucher discrimination, discrimination against Section 8 vouchers. Um, one, uh, to educate and train voucher holders and their advocates. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to pause a moment for so people to, can review this slide. So some of the strategies. Um, include to educate and train voucher holders and advocates about their rights, uh, to do testing or in, in, uh, investigations. Um, uh, there's a lot of testing. There's even some national uh, programs in other parts of the country that are doing telephone tests in California um, uh, to determine whether or not there is discrimination. There's um, also a lot of housing providers that will post things Either on um, and their um, on their websites and so forth. So there's it could be also review of um, anything that they post that says whether or not they will accept a, a voucher, a Section Eight, or a government subsidy. Uh, there's private enforcement, which is basically filing a lawsuit um, and hopefully getting a large award or or a settlement um, and promoting it on media uh, so that um, it would discourage other housing providers from engaging in the same illegal activity, if nothing else, because they know it will um, hit them in their in their pocketbook. Another strategy is to advocate for improvements in technology that addresses delays in communication with public housing authority agencies and with submitting documents. Pushing for state and local funding of enforcement efforts push for federal legislation to protect discrimination against government subsidy vouchers, increase for voucher payment standards, um, which I, I, let me just kind of say, uh, HUD has allowed for um, cities and jurisdictions to increase their, their um, farm mar market rates. Um, and so I know some cities like, this, like Los Angeles have done so that they can do smaller areas. And so that time that, will help tenants because if that area has a higher uh, fair market rental rate, then the tenant has more money basically to use for potential housing. So that's um, uh, you know something else. Another would be to expand the time in which a tenant can uh, look for and process and get the um, their application and their rental assistance uh, done. And the last is uh, rebanding section eight. Next slide, please. Um, and so just uh, quickly, this is a, a kind of, I think the last substance of slide we have, and that is uh, the use of artificial intelligence. Um, it is uh, because of the time limitation, and I'll just kind of summarize here, um, uh, but there are some links on this slide 
to um, articles and to some recent cases that have uh, uh, that uh, relied upon well, one that basically said that the housing providers' use of artificial intelligence was actually um, uh, itself discriminatory. Um, so there's a, a link to an article here on Fortune in which it says um, it, it talks about that AI is already screening. Uh, rental applications and um, but the, and there's almost no oversight of this right now. This is unfortunately still a very new um, uh, kind of a territory. Um, there's also a link to uh, a case that was filed last year at a out of Massachusetts to black women section eight tenants who am in that part of the country when you apply you like call a number and you need to be called back and that's where the discrimination happened. They weren't called back, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest in July of 2023 in the case because it was that egregious. And just last month in March, of um, it settled for $2.2 million. Um, there's also um, a press release here about another settlement um, of another Section 8 voucher discrimination case in Evanston, Illinois. Um, and I think what this is a really good resource that the National Consumer Law Center put out on digital denials and, and tenant um, application where they go into a lot more detail about um, in particular like the use of criminal history um, and other and credit, which we didn't really get into, but how credit is used in a discriminatory way uh, to screen tenants. And then lastly, um, the one federal thing that was uh, that has been done is there's was a White House executive order on the use of AI. Um, and uh, Lisa Rice of the National Fair Housing Alliance has also testified before the House Committee on the use of AI and, and how it impacts discrimination in housing. Thank you. So that brings us to the end. We have about three minutes and and uh, there's one question in the Q and A that I was wondering if Chancellor had thoughts about because I'm really at a loss. Other people may have thoughts as well, and if if you do, please drop those in the chat. But the question is, what are the landlord's options? For example, and this is when you know we're talking about the delays in getting uh, paperwork done and inspections done when you want to consider a Section Eight um, tenant. So Helen asks, what are the landlord's options? For example, rent the unit, but promise an available unit when the paperwork is done, have another tenant moving out, et cetera, or keep the unit vacant during the one to two months you know, that it takes to process and, and get the inspection done. And Chancellor, do you have, have thoughts on that? Like if, if people are advocating with landlords, what, what could we suggest if it really would be a hardship for the landlord to wait uh, two months to rent a unit? As, as, as I know you know, there's no set answer to this. Um, it's really trying to get the housing provider to try to think outside the box if they can, or um, in terms of really what would create a financial hardship for them, if there's any way at all they can mitigate that. Um, but it, it, it really is a case-by-case -case basis and, and really kind of hoping, hope, uh, hoping that the housing provider is being as transparent as possible in terms of um their 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 need um their need to to do so but yeah that's a hard question um and i'm just grabbing that link again i will be sending around um the powerpoint and the video the recording of this webinar will be posted on dredf's website uh probably in a, a week week and a half along with the powerpoint as well um i want to thank Chancellor, and also thank um, our captioner and ASL providers for today's webinar. And thank you all for attending. Have a great weekend. Thank you.